good evening, everybody. Uh, ni hao. I want to welcome you all to the Third Gallery. I'm a professor of politics here at the University of Sydney, and I was one of the people who had a hand in uh, a four-day festival of democracy, which is just coming to an end. Uh, we are all uh, exhilarated, uh, triumphant. It's been a wonderful four days where we discussed all kinds of things uh, from uh, the human and non-human distinction through to China, Iran, uh, to questions of inheritance uh, and democracy. And tonight we come to uh, a very special event. I wanted to say thank you very much to the Sydney Democracy Network uh, group, uh, to friends and associates, and particularly to the team who are somewhere scattered through this audience. Um, Lindy Baker uh, has, uh, in fact, uh, been the coordinator of this event together with Danny. I'm not sure where Danny is. He's um, here. Danny is there. Hello, Danny. Um, Janice, uh, is Janice here? And not Sherry. yet. And Sherry is here somewhere. Sherry, where are you? Ni hao. <laughs> somewhere. Uh, I would like actually uh, for everybody to, to give a round of applause to them for organizing all of this. Um, I want as well to acknowledge that we meet on the lands of the Yadigal people who have lived in this uh, country for some 40,000 years whose land this remains. And I want um, to welcome you all uh, to this very special occasion. This uh, series of The Silenced is special. It has been a long time coming in, in, in exhibiting terms. And um, we are, are really thrilled and honored and delighted to host uh, Wang Xu's uh, wonderful work here. We're also very privileged uh, to have uh, John Yu with us, who is going to say some words about uh, John Yu is, uh, was born, I think, in Nanking some time ago. Uh, arrived in Australia when he was three or four, uh, became a very distinguished pediatrician, uh, someone who has done many things and, and, and contributed to the Chinese Australian community uh, writ large. Someone who has been, for example, the Chancellor of the University of New South Wales. Uh, you have been involved in uh, Viz, Viz Asia. Uh, you are a distinguished expert on art in, in Southeast Asia. And um, John, you, you may know, probably you all know, was Australian of the Year in 1996. Um, John, uh, we invite you to say a few words about uh, these paintings and want you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, John and Lindy Jane, and of course the artist, my friend Wang Shu. Uh, I'm really pleased that something like the Democracy Network is brave enough to put on a show like this. Because I think it's important that we see what happened historically and not only see it but recognize it. Uh, I'm not talking necessarily making judgments, political judgments, but just acknowledging that something actually happened. And something which I think upset a lot of people. Uh, the first time I was in Beijing was long before 87. But when I subsequently went back, Tiananmen Square had a different feeling. And I suspect it was a recognition or even sensing the ghosts of those people who were killed. <coughs> Wong Shu is a very distinguished Australian painter. Uh, I had the pleasure of actually conferring a master's degree on Shu at the University of New South Wales when he graduated in Coburg. And that was something really very exciting. 
And the nice thing about our universities is that we recognise a lot of people for what they are currently doing, what they're thinking, what they're writing, what they're painting. And it really doesn't matter what their race is, naturally. It doesn't really matter what their religion is. And it certainly doesn't matter what their politics are. And I think if universities ever reach the stage where they are concerned about things like that, then they really don't deserve to continue to function as universities. Wong Shu, as many of you would know, came to Australia after Tiananmen Square. Uh, he was part of that really lucky band who was the benefit of Bob Hawke's statement about Chinese students and Chinese in Australia following Tiananmen and offering them protection and citizenship. One would hate to think what would happen if Mr. Morrison had been anything to do with it in those days. And I suspect what we would have done is instead of welcoming them, we would have sent them back to China or not even admitted them here in the hope that might have meant a few extra contracts for our miners. But it didn't happen. And Australia was really very lucky to have a whole group, a whole cohort of new citizens. In the way, in another and earlier time, we were really very lucky to have all those Vietnamese boat people who came down following the fall of Saigon. And whilst the politics might have been different, the circumstances are the same. Uh, I've said in other situations that I'm a refugee. My mother and my sister and I escaped from Nanjing. Nanjing is where you were then when the Japanese invaded. And uh, we were refugees, forced out of our home by circumstances not within our control. And we came to Australia. But we actually came on a passenger line. And I always talk about it as coming by the boat, because I think it has a different connotation. <laughs> and I also tell the story that when I came to I was carried ashore by a prominent politician. And so, when I came ashore, my arrival wasn't documented by immigration. And it was only later when my mother tried to get food coupons for me, because this was during the war, the Second World War, that uh, everyone realized that I had come in the country without being documented. So I guess, like some of you here tonight, there may not be anyone here tonight, but I was a refugee, I was a boat person, and I was an irregular arrival because I didn't get documented adequately. And I think we, when we think about people who come to Australia, and we may yet face large numbers of people as a result of what's happening in the Middle East, Rather than making judgments about them, we need to think about what they might offer this country, what's, what skills they might bring to us, and what different understanding we might have by embracing them as part of our family. Now, Wong Xu, following his experiences, really felt very deeply about a group of people who were the, I guess, the, the people who suffered under Nazi Dom, and particularly after he had talked about the flowering of a hundred flowers and what happened to them. And uh, I guess like a lot of politicians, he didn't do what he promised, but instead those people who had strong views and expressed them were quietly dealt with. 
And I guess we need to be a little bit careful as we deal with some paranoia about what might be happening in the Middle East and how it might affect Australia, that we don't deny the democratic rights of other Australians who might have different views to us. But Bong Xu went back to China, interviewed 140, 150 people, and 64 of them looking at us tonight. It's an extraordinary work. When you look at the anguish on their faces, I think it tells you something. What I think is wonderful is that artists can say things that perhaps other people can't. And those of you who are interested in art, of course, will think of Goya, will think of the Spanish uh, Revolution, will think about things that happened in the Second World War and the way some people try to express their anger about that, sometimes in cartoons, but very often in paintings. Wong Xu has been brave enough to paint these images. Burge Gallery has been brave enough to hang them. But when you look at them, don't just think about the political statements that they might be making. Look a little bit about the anguish of the painter, but especially look at the extraordinary skill that he's showing in expressing how he feels. And that really is what art is all about. Uh, I've known Wong Chu for many, many years, and uh, he painted a picture of me and my late partner that was hung in the arch hall and it was a wonderful painting. And it captured everything that was important to me. Uh, I've always appreciated that, but it's made me understand a lot more about the man as opposed to the painter when I look at his works hanging here tonight. Uh, I admire them greatly, but I admire the painter even more. And I'm delighted to be associated with so many. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for those words, uh, John. I should mention that this uh, celebration tonight is also part of the Sydney Fringe Festival. And there was one person uh, in the room. Uh, I don't know where she is. I can't see anything. I feel like a rabbit in the headlights. But uh, Adele Webb, where is Adele? There is Adele's, I can see Adele's uh, hand. Adele, I wanted to thank you very much on uh, behalf of all of us, SDN, Fringe Festival, because actually this was your idea. Uh, and we are immensely grateful for that, and we're also grateful for what comes next. Uh, a little while ago, um, given that uh, silence is the theme of these paintings of Wang Shu, I approached uh, two people. Uh, one of them was Yu Yang, uh, who is somewhere here, uh, somewhere, there he is, uh, who, um, to whom I said, do you know a good poem? It could be in um, Mandarin or it could be in English on the subject of silence. I think it was on a Thursday, or possibly even a Friday, and on Monday morning, I had an email from him saying, I wrote this poem. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Yang, would you please uh, come and um, read us your poem, which I think is called To Speak or Not to Speak. Thank you so much. We're very grateful. This is uh, on behalf of, uh, in honor of Wang Chu. Thank you very much, Professor John Keynes. To speak or not to speak, that is the question. Whether it is stronger for our soul to suffer, to succumb, to be silent, or the sheer profanity unleashed by a perverse political fortune, or to be armed and to overwhelm the mist of bloody darkness, 
once and for all. To win, to prepare. No more. And by a war cry to say we conclude the millennia of oppression and discrimination that our soul is subject to. Verily a consummation which with enthusiasm to win, to prepare. To speak or not to speak? That is the question. To prevail a chance to the dangers, and there's the catch. For in that victory, what chaos may proceed gives us pause. There's the fear that wreaks havoc eerily long. For who could withstand the whips and scorns of tyranny, the, cons the constant surveillance and privacy abuse? The guest of all's bashes on the door at night, the epidemic of apathy and cynicism, the law's inertia, the propaganda of bureaus, and the endless tortures that we, the humble subjects, are about to withstand, to overcome. In the end, a trip to the undiscovered realm of death, where no explorer ever returns, perishes our thought. To withstand, to overcome. To speak or not to speak, that is the question. Conscience makes cowards of us all. However glorious our dreams might be, however equal our society could become, the torrent of our speeches always turned awry, and the name of action lost. No more, and by a war cry to say I conclude the millennia of oppression and discrimination that our soul is subject to, verily a consummation wished with enthusiasm to win, to prevail, and be all the sins foregone remembered. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jan. Um, Elizabeth Alexander is uh, now going to read um, one of the most famous poems uh, of the 20th century on the subject of silence by Adrian Rich. For those of you who may not know, Adrian Rich was um, arguably the most important um, woman poet from the United States uh, who had a lifelong concern with the subject of silence and in whose poetry two themes uh, constantly reappear. One is that do not think of silence as what is left over after speech. Think of silence as the substructure, the foundation on which our lives are led. That might sound innocuous, it might sound obvious, it might sound unchallenging, but there's a second theme in the work of Adrian Rich, which you're about to hear, where silence is a collaborator with power. And she in particular was interested in the way in which the silencing of women uh, serves as a basic prop of the domination of men over women. This poem, not easy to read, uh, is going to be read by Elizabeth Alexander, who is a student here at uh, the University of Sydney. She's very polished in many ways, and is going to try her hand at a very tough poem called Cartographies. Of silence. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for coming. Cartographies of Silence by Adrian Rich. A conversation begins with a lie, and each speaker of the so called common language feels the ice flow split, the drift apart, as if powerless as if up against a force of nature. A poem can begin with a lie and be torn up. A conversation has other laws, recharges itself with its own false energy, cannot be torn up. Infiltrates our blood, repeats itself, inscribes with its unreturning status the isolation The classical music station playing hour upon hour 
in the apartments, the picking up and picking up, and again picking up the telephone, the syllables uttering the old script over and over, the loneliness of the liar living in the full network of the lie, twisting the dials to drown the terror beneath the unsaid word. The technology of science, the rituals, the etiquette, the blurring of terms, silence and not absence, of words or music or even raw sounds. Silence can be a plan rigorously executed, the blueprint to a life. It is a presence, it has a history, a form. Do not confuse it with any kind of absence. these words begin to seem to me. Though begun in grief and anger, can I break through this film of the abstract without wounding myself or you? There is enough pain here. This is why the classical or the jazz music station plays, to give a ground and meaning to our pain. The silence that strips bare Andrea's passion of Joan Balcometti's face, hair shorn, a great ge geography, mutually surveyed by the camera. If there were a poetry where this could happen, not as blank spaces, or as words stretched like skin over meanings, but as silence falls at the end of a night through which two people have talked till dawn. The scream of an illegitimate voice it has ceased to hear itself. Therefore it asks itself, how do I exist? This was the silence I wanted to break in you. I had questions, but you would not answer. I had answers, but you could not use them. This is useless to you and perhaps to others. It was an old theme even for me. Language cannot do everything. Chalk it on the walls where the dead poets lie in their mausoleums. If at the will of the poet the poem could turn into a thing, a granite flank laid bare, a lifted head alight with dew. If it could simply look you in the face with naked eyeballs, not letting you turn, till you and I who long to make this thing were finally clarified together in its stare. No, let me have this dust, these pale clouds dowry lingering, these words moving with ferocious accuracy like the blind child's fingers or the new, uh, newborn infant's mouth, violent with hunger. No one can give me I have long ago taken this method. Whether a bran pouring from the loose woven sack or the Bunsen flame turned low and blue. If from time to time I envy the pure annunciations to the eye, the vizio beautifica, if from time to time I long to turn like the Ulysian hierophant holding up a simple ear of grain for the return to the concrete and everlasting world, what in fact I keep choosing are these words, these whispers, these conversations, from which time after time the truth brings moist and green. Uh, well, uh, indescribably beautiful, indescribably complicated, Privately uh, disturbing. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, who, by the way, is um, not available. Um, if there are any talent um, spotters here, she's not available, she's ours. Um, and who could do that, by the way, in Mandarin, uh, just as well as in English. So thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, we, we come to Wang Shu. Uh, some months ago, actually, it goes back at least a year, and probably a year and a half, we talked about how to exhibit uh, the silence. And some of you will know, and John, you 
uh, mentioned that there is something like a tragic comedy, uh, a prehistory of this exhibition. There were more than a few attempts to um, mount it, and on each occasion they were scuppered. So tonight is a triumph. So some months ago I uh, had a conversation with Wang Shu about um, saying a few words about his work. No, 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 he said. No, 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 it's, it's fine. And it reveals uh, Wang Shu's modesty, uh, his tremendous humility. Of course, it reveals also that it's absurd for an artist to speak about her or his work. This is, that is, this makes no sense. But I wanted to say, um, uh, her me, uh, for this exhibition. Xi Xi Li, thank you so much for uh, all of the energy and, of course, the wonderful work and your commitment uh, and your loyalty to us in uh, in helping uh, uh, stage this uh, exhibition and to have this finale of the uh, Fringe Festival and the Sydney Democracy Networks Democracy Festival. Wang Shu, uh, under some pressure and a little bit of arm twisting, agreed to say a few words, and he's going to say a few words in Mandarin, and uh, Yu Heng, wherever Yu is, is going to do a brief translation. So, Perni, uh, the warmest congratulations, and thank you very much.首先欢迎各位光临我的画展首先我感谢新一大学民主网络和各位教育举办这次展览感谢我的张律师讲的话这次展出的是我的被承诺这些年中国的确发生了巨大的变化从一个贫困落后的国家迅速变成一个世界经济总量第二之大国于是有人相信中国已开启一条中国独特的道路不需要西方式的民主制度有一党统治也可以实现全国梦宣扬绝不走多党
，一九五七年反右运动被打成右派的学生、职工和干部，记录了他们的经历。这些大多以八十多岁的老人们坚持不懈的抗争，要求当局对毁没其呃毁灭其一生的罪行道歉，补发二十年的工资。这样最低的诉求诉求，至今无人答理。反右运动已经过去二五十七年了，中中国诺贝尔和平奖得主还关在牢里，维权律师还不断被抓，教授学者在家中聚谈也算犯罪，诗人艺术家有的被监视居住，有的被驱逐出境，每条街道每一个居民区都有红姑的安全员监视，人们的房产被强行拆毁，农民的土地被暴力抢。人民面对着武警和雇佣的流氓，无处说理，只有被沉默。宪法规定的言论自由还从未实行过。看到有人采访几位北京大学生的录像，记者问他们：“这幅一人只身、只身党坦克的照片说的是什么？”几个大学生互相对视，摇头不解。有一人竟回答说：“是不是行为艺术？”几十年下来，这段惨烈的历史逐渐在下代人的脑中消失。这就是我做这些作品的背景。现现在下面我是感谢所有为这次展览做出贡献的朋友们，我就不一一分享。Welcome to you. Welcome to you all to my exhibition. First, I'd like to thank the Sydney Democracy Network and the Verge Gallery of the University of Sydney for holding this exhibition. And I would also like to thank Dr. John Yu for his speech. The exhibition contains some of the works in my series, The Silent, from 1957 until now, completed over the past few years. It has been 25 years since I migrated to Australia from Beijing after the 1989 Tiananmen incident. Things have Uh, have genuinely changed dramatically in China in the past 25 years, with the scale of its previously impoverished economy elevated to be the world's second largest. People thus believe that China has initiated a unique socio-economic model in which a one-party state without Western democratic systems could also realize its superpower dream, in which the ruling party claims that it is the will of the people to not follow the erroneous way of multi-party parliamentary system with division of power. Similar to the ancient Egyptian pharaoh's construction of pyramids on slave labor, an autocracy could improve the economy rapidly at the cost of human rights. But what are the purposes of development? What are its means and costs? Is it for the people or for the powerful? Is it inspiring or restraining people's wisdom? Is it promoting or destroying Chinese civilization and social morality? Is it learning from history and correct the historical wrongs or manipulate and conceal the history? Is it building a society based on liberty, democracy, and the rule of law, or is it an empire of power? Without any check and balance under freedom of speech, China has become the paradise of the magnet and corrupt officials. The media and the administrative system are under the CCP's full control, leaving, leaving no chance for the people to express their own concerns, to fight for their own rights, or to select their own political systems and leaders. All they can do is to be silent. These are the Chinese characteristics. The outright ban on freedom of speech began in 1957, when Mao Zedong called for the help from the intelligentsia to rectify the wreck of the Communist Party. After some moderate criticisms and suggestions were raised, three million intellectuals were classified as writers and were sent to labor camps. Many of them were executed or starved to death during the two decades of persecutions. Due to the silence of people, Mao was able to launch a series of disastrous campaigns, such as the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. In the past few years, I have interviewed more than 100 people who, as students, staff, and officials, were classified as writers in 1957 and recorded their experiences. Most of those people in their 80s are still fighting for justice, demanding the government to apologize and repay 20 years of wages for its crime, which ruined their lives. Such basic pursuits are still unanswered. The anti-right movement ended 57 years ago, but the Chinese Nobel Peace Prize laureate is still imprisoned. Human rights lawyers are still arrested, 
Intellectuals are convicted simply because they dis discuss at her. Poets and artists are either under constant surveillance or deported. Every street and every living quarter is strictly monitored by security guards. Forced demolitions of people's properties, violent seizures of farmland, and the confrontational armed police and government employed thugs, all of these prevent people from fighting for their rights and make them silent. The freedom of speech, which was stipulated in the Constitution, was never implemented. I saw a video interview of several university students in Beijing in which a journalist asked them about the photo of an individual standing in front of the tanks. The students were confused, and one of them even replied, this may be a performance art. After so many decades, this tragic history is fading away from the memory of the next generation. And this is the social historical context of my works. Thank you all to, to those who have contributed to this exhibition. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I think it would be uh, fitting uh, to have a very loud uh, round of applause for Wang Shu and the uh, uh, effectively the opening of this exhibition. And may I suggest that um, afterwards you honour these paintings by making lots of noise and having lots of good conversation. Wang Shu, thank you very much and uh, congratulations.